assume, we are, we're assuming 60 years to the same woman? Yes. My wife and I have been married for 48. Yeah, we're, I don't believe I'm going to catch up to you. It's sort of like trying to catch up to the ladies' Bible study in the book of Acts. I'm never going to do it because they're already done. So there you have it. You know, one of the things that blesses me, I mean, you can hear about Marlo and June and Mary. How many years did you say, 60? How many years have you been married? 163. Something like kind of that. Uh, in a world where where it seems like hardly anybody stays married anymore, and people get married, divorced and remarried as fast as they can find somebody new and better. Find somebody that has a testimony and been married all these years. It's just remarkable. It's just a glory to God. It's a glory to God because as Babs, my wife has often said, the fact that we've been together for almost 48 or 48 years is only accountable by the grace of God. So, <laughs> well, I think yes, but then again, my wife is, has put up with a lot, which is, she'll get her crowns in heaven, I imagine. Hey, did anybody happen to see this morning, I know some of you don't have TVs, but Charles Stanley was on this morning. Anybody watching? Did, did you get to watch the one about the prodigal son? Was that the one? Did you think that was extremely special this morning? Or just did it, boy, that just touched me. He had a, an interesting twist, of, not a twist, but an interesting perspective that was in here somewhere, but nobody ever said quite that way. It was a marvelous salvation message, is what it was. Just powerful salvation message. And, uh, yeah, that, and I think that was only the second part, so this coming week will be part three. But he was, he's been especially, I don't know, maybe just me, I thought he was probably as good a message I ever heard him preach, and I've heard him preach a lot of them. But I'm not telling you to send him money or anything. But he's, because he doesn't ask for money, as opposed to a lot of other guys. Anyway, um, if you get a chance to, it was on at uh, 8 o'clock on some channel. So anyway, okay. Just for your information, if you're if you're compelled to throw an arm around Linda because you just can't stand keeping away from her, she's such a wonderful woman. Be careful today because she had a shingle shot in her left arm, and I made a mistake first thing. Patting her on the left shoulder, and she about swung around and punched my lights out. So, don't touch me. So, yeah, seriously, be careful. And uh, Donna gave okay, us a quick update on poor Shirley. Um, Shirley had, I won't get this all right, but with some of the salve or treatment they put on her wound was a silicone based thing. Turns out she. So the whole thing. She was allergic, oh. and she's got burns on her leg. But that's being that's corrected, and uh, but she's been instructed to keep her leg up uh, whenever she is up and standing and walking around, which better be a good portion of the time. So it's hard to keep Shirley down, but um, this has taken a while this time around. It seems to get a handle on. So she's seeing a, a, a real doctor tomorrow, would you say? So we're hopeful. Well, she's seen her for Friday, but if the doctor, the nurse practitioner seen her Friday. Right. She'll see the doctor Monday. Right. So let's continue to be in prayer. She won't be here this morning, and uh, we'll always miss her. God bless you. Ah, okay. We're in Judges chapter 9, we're kind of plowing our way through.
We're not going to spend a whole lot more time in Judges. Um, but there's such an interesting, anywhere you go in Scripture, don't you just kind of, God bless you, are you all right? I thought maybe we were looking to Peter's cologne. <laughs> But isn't it true, every time you open the scriptures, it doesn't matter where you are, I mean, you can just go like this, and you can read a pass and say, oh my goodness, that's so wonderful, that's so beautiful, let me spend some time there. Some people do study that way, I don't prefer to do it that way, but the point is, God's word is, you just kind of sit amazed when you start reading the word of God, it's like, really? That is so intriguingly beautiful and powerful. Chapter 9 is um, about Abimelech, who <coughs> I don't understand quite why so much is written about him, considering he was such a bad actor. Um, but I think there's some lessons to be learned. What I'd like to be thinking about today and relative to Abimelech in this passage is just to quickly look at who he is and where, what he's doing and then to um, see how he meets his demise because that's really what I want. And I've given you, there's no uh, notes for the worship this morning because Eric, how do you say his name, Gravel? That's it. Gravel and his wife will be here this morning. I'm are going to share a little bit, so uh, my message will be quite abbreviated, so I didn't think we needed notes this morning. So I kind of gave you a, a double whammy. I gave you a right-hand column, a left-hand column, and a whole back shot. So uh, we won't get to it all. I'll just refer to some of those things. But at any rate, let's take a look at this. In the Bibliac, uh, chapter 9 of Judges, and the Bibliac, the son of went to Shechem unto his mother's brethren and communed with them and with all the family of the house of his mother's father, saying, Speak, I pray you, in the ears of all the men of Shechem, whether it is better for you, either that all the sons of Jerubbabel, which are three score and ten persons, reign over you, or that one reign over you. Remember also that I am your bone and your flesh. Situation, of course, is Abimelech has 71 brothers. That's a same mother. What? Yeah, the same mother died. Yeah. She was soup. She had the genes of a rabbit. So. <laughs> For those of you who maybe uh, forgotten a little bit about the story, he decides he wants to be king. Uh, and in order to be king, he must, like all one of these, has to eliminate any potential competition. So he can eliminate all of his brothers. And he engages in this intrigue, this political intrigue, that says, uh, you want to be ruled by 70 guys bumping around? Or, hey, look at me. Hey, I'm right here. I'm available. <laughs> I'm a pretty good guy. Um, I'm in the family. I'm flesh of your flesh, bone of your bone. This is good. So choose who you want. Well, um, verse 3, And his mother's brethren spake with him in the ears of all the men of she Shechem all these words, and their hearts inclined to follow Abimelech. And they said, He's our brother. And they gave him three score and ten pieces of silver out of the house of Baal Barith, where with Abimelech hired vain and light persons which followed him. So they give him some money. They take him a collection. This is pretty cool. This is, uh, he must have been persuasive in his words. And Shechem, the people of Shechem, uh, rather than have God be king over them, Lord over them, they're going to pick out Abimelech, and they give him a bunch of money, where he goes out, and he hires, basically, I, King James is interesting here, I frankly don't think it's strong enough, when he says he hired vain and light persons. 
Uh, if you explore those words, they're broader than what they sound, but they're just a bunch of bad guys. They're mercenaries. They're mercenary soldiers hired to go out and eliminate opposition. That's who they are. They're men without scruples. They're hired guns, and Abimelech hires them for what purpose? To eliminate his competition. His brothers, and he went to his father's house at Ophrah and slew his brethren, the sons of Jerubbaal, being threescore and ten persons upon one stone. Notwithstanding yet, Jotham, the youngest son of Jerubbaal, was left, and he hid. So in one, uh, one motion, in one place, Abimelech's eliminated basically all of his opposition, except for one. <laughs> and Jotham. We, we will come back into the story, obviously. How he managed to escape is only the grace of God, I'm sure. But what is going on here is that he decides he's, Abimelech that is, is going to take control of this whole region. And as he assembles men and army to do so, Jotham uh, stands up at a distance and shouts to the army and the people of Shechem and gives them this analogy, um, which basically says, don't do it, because if you do this with Abimelech, you're going to meet with catastrophe. So we go to chapter 9, verse 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, because the, the thing I want to emphasize here is that Abimelech started out greedy, selfish, egotistical, sinful, narcissistic, all the words you can think of. He's self-centered. The world revolves around Abimelech. And the more power he gets, the more his world expands around him. He's the center of the universe. He's the king, basically. He's the leader. He's the judge. But in, at the end of the chapter, in verse 45, And Abimelech fought against that city all day, and he took the city and slew the people that was therein, and beat down the city, and sowed it with salt. Now, that's an interesting phrase. He destroyed the city, and then to make it utterly useless, he spread salt on the ground to make the ground utterly useless. So when he destroyed something, he wasn't just like kicking it over. He was kicking it over and poisoning the whole ground. That's how vindictive he was. He wanted to demonstrate his power, his ruthlessness, and um, it's, it's just terrible. In verse 46, and when all the men of the tower of Shechem heard that, they entered into an hole of the house of the god of Barak. And it was told to Bimelech that all the men of the tower of Shechem were gathered together. And Abimelech gat him up to Mount Zalman, he and all the people that were with him. And Abimelech took an axe in his hand and cut down a bough from the trees and took it and laid it on his shoulder and said to the people that were with him, What you have seen me do, make haste and do as I have done. And all the people likewise cut down every man his bow and followed Abimelech and put them to the hole and page, on fire upon them so that all the men of the tower of Shechem died, also about a thousand men and women. So here they escaped to this tower, which is supposed to, and that's really where I want to move to briefly this morning, something about a tower. Uh, every city that amounted to anything that had some kind of commerce or a state, state leader, king, a mayor of some sort or another king, they would, it was typical of all medieval and ancient cities, they built a wall around the city, and in most cases, even in Jerusalem, there were certain watchtowers. This was a massive tower, apparently, in Shechem, and all the people that were not in favor of Abimelech. They saw how ruthless, violent, cruel he was, escaped to this tower, and it must have been a huge thing. You could get a thousand people in. And Abimelech says, sure, go ahead up that tower. 
We'll just, we'll just start a fire. We'll kill you all. I don't care. This guy has got such bad blood in him, it's hard to imagine that he would murder, as the record says here, a thousand men and women, about a thousand. They must have had a pretty raging fire going on in there. Lots of smoke, lots of heat, and he cooked a thousand people. But now something happens here in the next verse, and he went and then went Abimelech to Tebez and encamped against Tebez and took it. So here's the second city he was going to overtake and uh, make subject to his leadership, to his authority. But something, and you know the story, something quite unusual happens here. But there was a strong tower within the city and thither fled all the men and women and all they of the city and shut it to them and get them up to the top of the tower. This is a different tower. This is not the same tower and it's not the same town, but this tower is a strong tower and all the people run into it. You like that? Because you know where we're going to Proverbs 18 in just a moment. And this is a really exciting thing because for all his strength, for all his narcissism, for all his ego, for all his self-centeredness, he will meet his doom, at the, at Abimelech will meet his doom at this strong power. And so in the next verse, and Abimelech, this 52, came unto the tower and fought against it and went hard unto the door of the tower to burn it with fire. Hey, that worked good last time, didn't it? Well, it isn't going to work good this time. Verse 53. And a certain woman, not even named, cast a piece of millstone upon Abimelech's head, and all to break his skull. I love that expression. <laughs> Drop this rock right on the dude's head and, and kill him, basically. Knock the call that her, I don't know, but he's done. But a woman did. A woman did it. There you go. Now, this is a curious thing. In the note somewhere at the bottom, I put this, this curious observation we can make. You see, God is no respecter of persons, and he uses male and female, Jew and Greek, slave and free, when he chooses to. And when he chooses to use a woman, he uses a woman in a big time way. And <laughs> we've looked at Deborah before, and then J.L., who drove the tent peg through uh, the, the head of the escaping commander. And now we have just a woman who has no name. She's not named here. She's just an unknown name. Was this a lucky drop? Oh, yeah, there he is. No, they're chucking rocks over the side. And some woman dropped this rock over the side and cracked his skull wide open. What a phrase in the King James. And all to break the skull. I love that. you got to be tickled by that. Because here you have this book. They're all up there. They have to know what happened previously in Shechem. Where else are we going to go but up the tower? Because if we stay down here, he's going to kill us all anyway. We might just as well go up to the tower and afford some protection. Except this time, instead of passively letting them bring all the, the tree branches and all the wood, let's pelt them with rocks. That's all we got. And she, I don't know. What's that? What's that? They must have carried them up the tower with them. Well, I think they may, they may have brought some up, but I think the tower was made out of stone, and they probably broke off pieces somehow or another. Might have been some rubble up there. Well, you know... No, not a wood. So, this particular, you know, I, I don't know if you've ever been whacked in the noggin with anything before, but think about, is these are a tower that you get a thousand people in, it's got to be, the diameter's got to be pretty good, and it's got to be pretty tall. So even if you drop like a railroad stone, you know what I'm talking about, something that size, size of a baseball, and you hit the guy on the head just right, you kill him. 
So you didn't have to throw them. You could just drop them. Yeah.
Well, it turned out, Babs and I was so proud of that truck when we got it because it was the nicest thing we ever rode in in our whole life. And we decided we're going to go to Detroit, to Ann Arbor, to her sisters, so we get in that truck and down that road and come back. And I thought, and I thought, you know, this wheels are really funny. Every time I have to put on the brakes hard, the whole front of the truck goes like this. And I'm like, what is going on with that? And I thought, you know, I don't think those back brakes are engaging. So I pulled the back wheels off, and there were no brakes at all. Oh, they were completely non-existent. It was just a truck and no brake shoes or anything, no springs, no tensions. So I called the guy, there's no back brakes, how could you expect it? Ah, you want it, it's yours. And I'm like, really? You can't do that. He did it. So I downloaded the pictures on the internet of how to put back brakes on and did it myself. But reputation and that reputation of a person's name is very difficult to earn the respect of and very easy to have it destroyed quickly. You know that. But the name of the Lord is a strong tower. So the reputation of who God is. Um, I shared with you before Charlie Vite was a guy in school who everybody was uh, afraid of. He said, Charlie Vite, and he just felt like, ooh, where is he? Let's get out of here. But how does that work for you? The name of the Lord is a strong tower. Have you ever done this? The name of the Lord is a strong tower. I love this verse. The righteous run into it and they're safe. Sing that in the song. What's that? Sing that in the song. I know, I, but I couldn't think of it tonight. I was going to ask Ed, but I figured, well, he's already let us enough. But, um, and when we pray, we pray in Jesus. In name. Jesus' name. And I remember once our grandson, Dalton, when he was about 10 or 12, asked me, why do we pray in Jesus? Why do we always say that? I had to pause and think, because it's a powerful name. And Jesus says, if you ask anything, Names are important. The name of God, the Father, the Holy Spirit, the Son, the personhood of the God, and the persons that make up the Godhead. Um, in number three, let's just, uh, I'm just kind of trying to go somewhat rapidly. What does God promise to those who run to Him and trust in that strong name? What does He promise to you when you run to Him? Are there any assurances if you run to him? Eternal life. Yeah, obviously. The potential of Obviously. Eternal life. That's the it's that's the paramount. That's the that's the that's the end ultimate, you know, to have eternal life. Are there any other things though? I mean that I mean you can't do better than eternal life. But is there anything else that God promises to those who run to Him? Dale, you're thinking. Comfort, guidance. Comfort, guidance. Well, in Psalm 46, a very present help in trouble. Very present help in times of trouble. To make a quick analogy here to the book of Judges, the people run into this strong tower to escape the enemy, and they're safe. That's, isn't that what we do when we are believers? We run to Christ, to He is my strong tower, His name is my strong tower, and He will deliver me from my enemies. Aren't so many of the Psalms about David's deliverance from his enemies by trusting in God, by trusting in the name of the Father? I think it's a powerful thing. I've supplied another a bunch of verses there for you. Um, you can look at them as time goes up by, but I want to share with you this song by um, Hillsong. And it is probably not a song most of you are familiar with because I'm discovering that, um, well, I don't know, 
do it, that you probably don't listen to much contemporary Christian music because a lot of it is many God not good, and some of it is awfully wonderful, biblically sound. This song is one which I think does a number of different things, but I think it's biblically sound. It's uh, it, it, when, when this song is performed at one of their concerts or conferences, um, it reduces people to bowing down and uh, confessing their sin and trusting in Christ and believing in the name of Christ. But what it does, let me just read through this here. You were the word at the beginning, one with God, the Lord most high, your hidden glory and creation now revealed in you, our Christ. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. The beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. You didn't want heaven without us. So Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin was great, your love was greater. What could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ. What a wonderful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. Death could not hold you, the veil tore before you. You silenced the boast of sin in the grave. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory. For you are raised to life again. You have no rival. You have no equal. Now and forever, our God reigns. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the glory. Yours is the name above all names. Amen. What a powerful name it is. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a powerful name it is. Nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is the name of Jesus Christ. You have no rival. You have no equal. Now and forever, our God reigns. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the glory. Yours is the name above all names. What a powerful name it is. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a powerful name it is. Nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ. If you have opportunity sometime this week, and I encourage you to click on it. Some of you won't like it, uh, sung, and you may not like the venue in which it's sung. But now that you've heard the words, if you find fault, any biblical fault in the words, then that would be one thing. You may not like the way it's presented in some of the concerts. But if you click in this, what a beautiful name, Hillsong Worship on YouTube, it will come up. And uh, you'll have a video and audio uh, in front of you to listen to. And if you keep these words with you, you may not be able to hear all the words on the YouTube video, but you have these words in several of the videos taken during the Passion Conferences hosted by Hillsong and other uh, nationally known uh, evangelicals. Um, you, you will say, oh, just light and smoke and mirrors and all this and that. But when the camera begins to pan around in the auditorium, by auditorium I mean a basketball stadium filled with 27,000 college students and young professionals. And you see their reaction to this kind of truth. You may want to, you know, listen to it a couple of times. On the back of the sheet, I have given to you the names of God from the Old Testament. Now, I did that once before because dear Alice gave me that sheet, and I like it's good. I decided that's so important, we ought to have another one, just in case you misplaced the first one. And so I've given it to you, 
on the back side of that sheet. You can go through there. But as you look at these names, the names of the Lord is a strong tower. And if you go through those names, you realize how the name of the Lord is our strong tower. And the righteous run into it. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for Abimelech showing us that you are a just God. And we thank you for loving us. We thank you that you, the name of the Lord, is a strong tower. Proverbs 18.10. That's such a wonderful, powerful verse. It is coupled with so many other verses that tell us that you are the only. That there is no other name in heaven or earth ever before, even now, or ever in the future that will be higher than the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for sending the Son to rescue us. To help us see that the Son, Jesus, is a name above every name. We have run to Him as believers and have taken refuge in Him from the enemy of sin and death and its judgment. We praise You that we are always in a strong tower with Jesus Christ. We thank you this morning for your word. We pray your blessing on our time. And worship this morning in Christ's name.